Good morning once again to all of you. Our sermon text is the gospel text from today, Mark chapter 10, verses 32 to 45. We'll read it just once more. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and you will be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. Those places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the Gospel of our Lord. What does glory look like? What is glory? What does glory mean? Maybe glory for you is something external, right? I could say I'm restoring my old Dodge Dakota truck to its former glory, and I really might just mean a coat of paint. Or maybe I go outside on a walk and I look at the beautiful flowers you have planted along your church and I say, wow, those look glorious. It's a glorious day. Glory can be something intangible, right? Something you can't touch, a value or, or something honorable. They used to say that, that fighting and, and dying for an honorable cause, that was glorious or that working to the top of your professional field, there was glory in that too. Or maybe being the, the good Bible-minded Christians that you are, when I say glory, your brain jumps to heaven. And heaven really is a combination of both those definitions, right? Externally, it's perfect, blissful, beautiful perfection. And it's also full of the perfect righteousness of God, something most honorable and valuable to us. So how do we get glory? How do we become glorious? The disciples wondered that very thing. And that's why we get to where we are in our text, with Jesus walking to Jerusalem, his very own path to glory. But his path looks so different than we would expect as humans, right? It was long, it was treacherous, winding, and it led to tragedy. To you and I, that, that, that doesn't line up. This is the Son of God, right? He, he came to conquer enemies. He came to win, to save his people. To make sense of this path to glory, we need to listen to Jesus. And we need to follow him on his path to true Glory, a path marked by humble submission and only walked by divine intervention. So here we are on this path. We find Christ on the road to Jerusalem with his disciples, but not all is well on this little stroll into the city. The disciples are distracted. Jesus is giving them a prophecy, but it's like the porch light's on, but nobody's home. They're not quite there. The words he gives them are a beautiful proclamation of the culmination of all of his work for sinners on this earth, right? His death and resurrection. 
He says, we're going to Jerusalem so that I can be handed over to my enemies, condemned to death, right? Beat, spit on, mocked, murdered. But then I'll rise. And the disciples completely miss the point. They react with confusion or shock or fear. And then two of them bring a question that just seems outright inappropriate. James and John, two of the inner circle disciples, you could call them, who were there on the Mount of Transfiguration to see Christ's glory, they walk right up to Jesus and they ask him, we want you to do whatever we ask. It's as if James and John heard what Jesus was saying, but their eyes were laser-focused somewhere else. They were thinking about the wrong thing. So Christ is going to dig a little bit deeper to expose their hidden motive. He replies, what do you want me to do? In effect, he's saying, tell me a little bit more, guys. What do you mean by that? But imagine being James and John in this scenario. God just handed you a blank check that you can fill out with whatever wish you want. So they step right into his, his trap, so to say, and they expose where their hearts are. They say, let us sit at your right and left hand in glory, the seats of honor in heaven. They wanted the crown and not the cross. They, they wanted a nice spot in heaven. They wanted some just fruits and rewards for their labor as disciples. And preferably that, that glory would come before Jesus went and died. The problem is that James and John had a, a sinful, selfish understanding of what Jesus' glory really was. Christ's path to glory begins with humble submission. Keep in mind what he just said. He's walking to Jerusalem to face these horrible things. But he walks anyway. Because it was his Father's will. Because it was the way to save sinners from death. Christ responds to the disciples, these misguided brothers, with hard truth. He says, you don't know what you're asking. Can you really drink the cup I drink? Can you be baptized with my baptism? And they say, we can. They had no idea what the path to glory looked like. They thought they were on the same road as Christ. Physically, they were, right? Venturing towards the city of Jerusalem where finally they would get a hero's welcome, some acclaim and, and glory and welcome instead of rejection and public ridicule and insignificance, which was what they were used to. But Christ's path of humble submission is marked by those very things that James and John wanted to skip. Jesus demonstrates how to walk, and that he walked towards, yes, Jerusalem, but to Golgotha too, where the cross stood waiting for him. But yet he went. Have you and I ever looked for a shortcut like James and John did that day? Feel free to tell me if I'm wrong in this estimation, but I'll bet that at some point in your Christian life, you have wanted to tell off one of those Bible-bashing, God-hating people, and you've just wanted to tell them how wrong they were and how right you were and just end the religion argument once and for all with them. What if Jesus told you to hear those words and to let it go? To take the abuse and to walk away? What kind of leader are you, Jesus? Do I want to follow the man who tells me to, to walk in pain and suffering and shame and embarrassment? Our sinful nature pushes back on Christ's invitation to walk in humility with him because we like the path of least resistance. So Christ has hard truth for us, too. 
his path to glory, the, the, the brilliant and, and honorable glory that's only found in heaven, is one of humble submission. His path means that, yes, we drink the bitter cup of sufferings. And yes, we're baptized in, no, no drowned in earthly troubles at times. The second class position that we have as Christians in society, that's normal. The, the life of service to others that Jesus wants for us, that's a joy. It makes our sinful nature bristle in rebellion to God, but he, um, he humbly asks us to walk it. And to reject it means to condemn ourselves and walk a different path that leads to a dead end, pun intended. But Christ saw where we were headed and he loved us. He saw the destination that was at the end of our road and he acted out of love to save us from that inevitable conclusion. He lived a life we could not live, one of humility and sacrifice. So now look to the end of our path. We see a cross and an empty tomb that through Christ's death and, and pain and suffering and his glorious resurrection, we have true glory in death and in life. We have heaven one day, this, this perfection waiting for us. And while we walk on this earth, because of his death, we walk in grace and forgiveness all the days of our life. Christ drank that cup of suffering and he was baptized in the tumultuous waters of pain so that we might be, yes, humble followers, but even better, heirs to his glory. And the disciples, well, they were heirs to glory too, right? They had faith in Christ. Yet we see in this story that sometimes they went back to the old path. They reverted back to the old mindset of, of looking for earthly glory in some way or another. And just like them, we're guilty of that too. So often on this path, to Christ-like glory, we, we wander and we fail. Our own attempts to live like Jesus in humble submission go wrong. We need help. The walk to glory is only achievable by divine intervention. Jesus had to teach his disciples about this too. If you remember where we left off, James and John had just asked this bold question to Jesus. And it's not like the other ten disciples didn't hear what they said. The text tells us they were indignant with them. They were furious. You can't call dibs on heaven, James and John. That's not yours to do. So Jesus calms them down and he teaches them. He teaches them about humble submission. You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles ward it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus says it in so many ways he might just be serious about it, don't lord over or exercise your authority over other people unfairly. In fact, he takes it a step further. Be a servant and a slave to all. Suffer the insults and pain of this world with rejoicing. That doesn't help us. It just Christ is highlighting what this humble service looks like, but also he's showing us in all the ways that we fail. Because who wants to be a servant? Which one of you wants to be a slave first? Doesn't Christ know that, that you and I are Americans and that we were born with certain inalienable rights? Doesn't Christ know that I have the right to pursue my life, my, my safety, my happiness, however I need to? 
Doesn't Christ know that I don't need to put others' needs above myself to make someone else's life easier? The sinful, self-serving attitude is so ingrained in all of us. It's even our cultural standard. Me first, you second. Even when I try to focus on others, when I try to take on this servant's heart that Christ calls me to, immediately my sinful pride derails that. My good Christian living becomes my distraction from glory. And I walk in pride. We fail at this path to glory. We need help. We need divine intervention. Now, I've heard stories of divine intervention. I could tell you about a snowy highway in Michigan with a semi sliding down a hill towards a car full of my classmates, and all of them are fine. Maybe more famously, you remember in the news the miracle on the Hudson where the plane safely landed on the Hudson River instead of crashing and killing all the occupants. Or the story of the Chilean miners. 33 Chilean miners stuck deep in the earth for 69 days, and miraculously they survived and are rescued. But this divine intervention, this miracle of Christ in our text, is so much more than bodily safety. This is divine intervention that leads to eternal life and glory. Christ did it. He walked tirelessly, step by step, for us. He continued, despite being tempted, to look off to other places, to divert from this path to something a lot more easy to walk. He never took his gaze off the end, even though... There was a horrific crucifixion waiting for him, a public spectacle of shame. He says it perfectly in verse 45. He lived his life as a ransom for many. He did not come to be served, but to serve you. Christ lived this life, a payment for the world's sin, for your sin. His painful punishment means that you and I can walk in grace and forgiveness all the days of our life, even when we fail to walk on this path. He's something else entirely. He's God. So the work he did means something for you and I. The Son of God saw our imminent death, so he walked through pain and suffering to save you so that you can dwell in glory with him forever. That's divine intervention. So as we walk, and sin threatens to slow our feet down and entangle us down in briars and thorns, Christ cuts us loose. He forgives us and he keeps us moving on. Through the waters of of baptism and faith grown by the Holy Spirit, you and I are not dead people sitting on the ground were full of life and able to walk forward towards his cross and tomb. Of course, the walk's not going to be easy or predictable or consistent, but we know that we don't do it alone. We know that Christ, our Savior, is on that same path with us. He's walking in front of us, showing us the way, showing us where to go. He's our example. He he shows us how to walk. He's behind us, protecting us from evil. He forgives us, he picks us up, and he keeps us walking. And we will walk with him until that day when we live with him in glory forever. Amen.